Australia, the Montana information is relevant because the concepts are the same. We're dealing with concepts of trust, we're dealing with concepts of property, concepts of title, concepts of sale. All those principles are exactly the same. It's just the language and the forms need to be uh, made relevant to the various states. Sorry, Ron, far away. Oh, I just wanted to mention that um, someone had asked about getting the private documents like the EDP into court using their their heading and everything. Well, that's yep. my next project. So I'll have that posted in a couple of days at the U of U. Great. So it'll be templates again, just you have to plug in your information and then take it down to the court. Um, that's great. The courts are... They're getting more and more difficult. Um, they want everything done uh, the way an attorney would do it. But there are a, a, a few things that we can do to work around it. But the main thing is is to file your document in their format. Not we're not going to mess with the doc, with our document with the EDP. We're going to annex it as part of this filing. So that's that that works. They've taken my documents on that, but they don't like blood. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've they gone past do not that. like blood. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the point on that has been made, don't you? And I think uh, we've moved. We know that we've moved past past that. But oh, Ron, yeah. look, thank you. I know I know that you're doing a, a power of work for people, and uh, it's really really appreciated. And what I hope is people in other areas are going to take it up as they have um, in the States and in Australia too, take that up and hopefully add what they've learned uh, for the benefit of others through the open source sharing through the University of UK. So I hope, I really, really hope that that is going to be shared as well for others. But Ron, thank you. Is there anything else you want to cover? Oh, I'll, I'll tag in later. Okay. Good on you. Thanks, thanks, Ron. So I'll just mute you again and, and uh, thank you. Good on you. No problem. Thank you. Bye. Well, there are a number of questions that I've, I've seen uh, posted and, and if, if you do want to talk and I'd love to hear from you, all you have to do is, I think it's star eight or hash eight and a little bubble will appear and then I can unmute you. Uh, there are a couple of questions. One question which, which I was asked to, to answer and I'm sorry I didn't answer it earlier is the question about Gaelic. I've mentioned Gaelic and the question was uh, also from guest A, uh, is modern Gaelic a useful language to learn? I would say learning any language beyond your own is useful. If you only know English, then learning French, German, Latin, Greek, any language other than your own is useful. And I'll tell you why. When you start learning another language, you start seeing the similarities and the differences uh, between them, and you actually start to see the apparatus underneath. Now, when you learn a language as a, as a kid and you learn one language, much of it is taken on faith. So you don't know the meaning of words, and we spoke tonight about the word fear. You just don't know what these words are. You're taken on faith. But when you learn another language, what happens is you start to get glimpses of the apparatus. You start to get glimpses of the, of the old kind of workman's uh, footprints uh, or hands better in terms of what they and how they constructed words. So I think the same applies to Gaelic or Basque or any language that has an, an older uh, provenance uh, and that I think is a, a good one. Would I say Gaelic above others? Not, not really. Um, I think there's a lot to learn in French. Uh, there's a huge amount to learn in Latin. Um, so it's really what, what you, you find useful and interesting. Learning, all learning, is about doing something that you enjoy. So really, I hope that if you are thinking of a language or learning a language, you pick a language that you enjoy. So I hope I answered that question. I answered the question... For true trust on the proper annexing, you heard 
uh, Ron talk about what he's going to do. And JZ7 had a question. The question was, on step five in the EDP process, uh, do I need to attach the original documents? Um, under the discussion of what uh, Ron said, if it was going through the courts, no, you would, you would simply annex what has already been done, again in the form. If you're sending it to the officials, uh, I would suggest to you no. I mean, you could refer to the original documents that have been sent, which is what we normally do, and then send that, uh, that step. So the answer is no. Uh, let's see what other questions have come up, and let's see if we've got anyone else that has put the little bubble up uh, on there who wants to speak. Uh, at the moment, we don't have anyone putting up there uh, to talk live. Let's see if we have some other questions. One sec. Let's go through the format here. Um, uh, okay, just a follow-up from the question of Gaelic. I just see this here. The question was asked, um, following from the question about Gaelic, do you think the English language is part of the problem in that it is copyright of the Crown? A funny thing about English is that it goes both ways. Uh, yes, English is, is used in copyright as um, Latin is used to the ex exclusivity of the Vatican. And this is why they created the languages they created for this control. English, whilst it has been used as a language of control and in particular a language of dark magic, in in the fact that it has been used for that very reason also, I believe, is a language potentially of emancipation. A and the reason for that is, is that as we are describing things and talking of things, I am using English to express to you. And I hope you've sensed a few times that through English I have been able to transmit something greater than the inherent design of English. And I think another example of that is if you've read some of the great, great poetry of the great English poets. There is something about English, even though that they have uh, certainly designed it in such a way for control in many, many, many words where there is the spark that it could truly also be a language that frees us apart from the fact that it's been a language of imprisoning us. Uh, why? Because if you know the origin of a word in English, then truly the power comes. I just showed you with fear. You know the origin of that word. It, it is a very clear uh, reclaiming of power. Um, let's see if we have any... Uh, okay, we've got Ron is fired up again. So I'll just see if there's one more question on the chat and then I'll get back to Ron. Uh, let's see if there's any more questions here. Uh, I'm sorry, the, the design of the screen tonight and the way I'm hosting is making it very difficult to slide back and forth to see. I don't see any other questions at the moment up on the... Ah, here we go. We've got some questions here. Uh, I've got a quick, quick question here from True Trust again. Uh, the question is, Frank, while listening to your calls with Yoz, uh, you reference a resource you use for knowing the origin of breakdowns of words. What is it? Um, I I'm using uh, a series of dictionaries. I have a dictionary of Basque, a dictionary of Gaelic, a dictionary of French, uh, a dictionary of Greek, a dictionary of Latin. And I use these uh, and some online tools. So it's really a combination of these dictionaries pulled out and uh, comparing and hunting through. So that's what I'm using. Um, another quick question. Wuji says, sorry, Ron, I'll be one sec. Wuji says, uh, the saying you can only create with what you know or have. Does the details in Journey to UK to assist in one in creating? Yes, it does. Absolutely, it does. You use a framework, a framework of identification, classification, 
taxonomy, meaning, relation. You use these, uh, whether you're conscious of it or not. Your world, in fact, is very much guided by how things fit. And that is a physically affecting thing in your mind. Your mind and the neurons, and this is an area that, that science doesn't like to talk about, but your neurons actually physically are affected in their position based on the knowledge that you store. Now this is proven by people who uh, they've looked at their brains after they've died and seen the number of synaptic connections between neurons and there is a direct correlation to not just the amount of information but the way in which it's stored that physically changes your brain. So what I offer you is if you take the time, even though it takes quite some time, to read the journey of UCA, to read uh, divine law, natural law, to, the, to read the patents, that not only will it assist you, but it will change your perspective for the better, I hope, and certainly will help you in what you're doing. I'm going to take Ron's uh, call, and then I will get back to some of the questions that people have uh, been typing in. Thanks for that. Here we go. Here's Ron. Ron, can you hear us? Hi, Frank. I'd uh, like to answer True Trust, um, uh, the next question. It says, um, Ron, how do we reverse the years of filing the 1040? Well, if you're just trying to seek a, a refund, you can only go back three years, and then you would start at the, the last of the third year and work forward. Now, if you are behind in filing anything and they're sending you uh, notices and threatening to lean and levy you, then you have to go back to the first year that you that you were in the heirs with. In, in my case, it was 1995. So I went all the way back to 1995 and I came forward to 2010. So that gives you an idea of what you have to do. Now, I did my 709s on the 15th and 16th of February, and they have not answered them. But that doesn't mean that they won't. Here's the problem that the IRS now faces. They have stolen everything from me, stolen my home, my family, my property, everything, all based on fraud. And I outlined the fraud in... There's a cover letter that goes with every 709, and it outlines the fraud. You'll see it in the package. Um, so they have to deal with the, the massive amount of fraud, and I don't know how they're going to do it. And then last week I filed um, a complaint and claim against the United States and the U.S. Court of Claims. Um, there was 135 pages of exhibits plus uh, 13 pages on the complaint. And it was a single issue. And the issue was the fraudulent conversion of our compensation for labor into a income type uh, income, basically. See, there's a big difference between uh, compensation for labor and income. The IRS likes to blur the line. They, they say everything is income. Well, no, everything is not income. In a sense it is, but in, in legal sense it is not. So that's why Congress created the IRM 6209 to, to show people the true meaning of the word income and where it gets reported, stuff like that. Um, so anyways, that's, um, that's uh, my take on the 709. Yeah. Well, Ron, you, you you raised an important point. Sorry to butt in, but you raised an important point. But we we had spoken about this also, and that was we, as we learn, one thing that we've all been guilty of is putting too much into our documents. That is, when it's one cause, one issue, we've added everything in the kitchen sink, right? Right. Yes. And so while we are more diligent than the attorneys, we are certainly more, better read 
in a sense what we've done is we've given them